This is Dr. Thomas Klein. I'm coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. I am a specialist in people with long-term painful diseases like uh, complex regional pain disease, adhesive arachnoiditis, trigeminal neuralgia, post-operative uh, pain syndromes, post-automobile accident pain syndromes, interstitial cystitis, um, all of which can be um, summarized in a paper that we have prepared for the National Pain Council. Just go to the website and ask for a copy, and we will send you a copy of the most common painful diseases, most of whom, uh, most of which rather, have not been um, fully appreciated by the government or the medical profession. There is only one treatment for people with these incurable diseases, and that's pain treatment. So the topic today is to learn about opium, because opium is the only drug we have for pain other than Tylenol. Now it's developed a nasty reputation uh, because it is addictive. That we all know. But setting that aside, the poppy plant, which is a beautiful red flower, um, grows. Sorry, we only have a black and white photo. Um, in red, yellow. The red poppy has been a uh, subject for um, other uh, mythology for a long, long time. It represents sleep and it represents death, and it represents re, um, uh, reliving. And the people in Canada wear red poppies once a year in remembrance for the war. So poppies have, the flower itself um, has, there's the flower, uh, has a significance, but more importantly, after the flower dies off and you get these seed pods, and here's a picture of the seed pods. Guess what's in the seed pods? Poppy seeds. So they're not sure when this particular poppy, not all poppies have opium in them, uh, but this particular species, there's two species, uh, they think was planted about 6,000 BC. How do you know? Seeds the poppy seeds. They can actually take seeds and do a, a DNA analysis to find out what kind of plants they are. So for sure we know that poppy juice, which is the, if you nick this little seed pod, this stuff oozes out, which is opium or thebane to be more accurate. And it's a painkiller. You can put the stuff right from the, the the goo that oozes out after you nick these. You can put it right under your tongue and it works. You can also eat the poppy seeds. Now there's a peculiar thing about the poppy seeds. If you leave them on you know, the plant for longer than 20 days, they no longer have morphine in them. So you have to use the seeds right away. So we're thinking this is how uh, the folks way, way back did the, the seed pot itself is filled with these seeds. And I don't have a good picture of that. But anyway, it dries out. It has these compartments and it's filled with poppy seeds. So people used to eat the poppy seeds. Nowadays, if you eat a poppy seed bread and go have a urine test, it'll come out uh, that you've been on heroin. Guess why? <clears throat> so, what oozed out? Well, what oozed out are thebanes, which are the drugs used to make things like oxycontin and, and um, oxycodone. And there's also quite a few other chemicals. So what they discovered was that if you dry the poppy seed pod, you can cut it into pieces and then extract the opium from the pieces in addition to the seeds. So where do drug companies get opium? Do they need opium? Yes, they do, because they make 
the majority of pain medicines from raw opium. So somewhere there has to be an opium production facility. And guess where the United States buys its opium for making other drugs? Tasmania, of all places. Tasmania has been designated a legal producing, uh, production facility for opium, and they have these huge fields of um, opium plants and seed pods. They take the seed pods, they dry them out, and they take them to a factory on Tasmania run by... Johnson and & Johnson and another drug company. I forget which one it is. So two drug companies run these plants on Tasmania where they take these dried pods and they extract the various chemicals. Then they sell those chemicals to other drug companies to make pain medicine. So they're kind of like wholesale distributors. Now, we also contract with Turkey, at least we used to, to buy not this particular product called Thebane, but uh, morphine, pure morphine. So morphine was made about the time of Thomas Jefferson, at the turn of the uh, 18th century, 1807. And it's, it's a great drug. It's a matter of fact, it's still our best pain medicine because it can be given in any form. Drops, pills, you can do it nasally, they can be put in rectally, put in IV. It was used extensively during the Civil War. A lot of people think people of the Civil War suffered. No, they didn't. They had tons. They learned by now to buy and grow poppies and they had tons of pain medicines available, opiate pain medicines. They used to actually sprinkle it in the wound. An interesting thing was that of the six and a half million people involved with the Civil War, there was quite a few people that became addicted, 100,000. So what we know in our group is the reason everybody didn't become addicted is because it is genetically controlled. Remember, there's a gateway. Remember the analogy of the basketball and the little place where he put in the... Um, uh, air uh, needle. What's gone wrong in people's brains where these medicines tend to reside in receptors like the little thing you put the needle in, something's wrong with the receptor. Normally when you put a needle into the basketball, it's the receptor part is designed in such a way that air doesn't run out. But what happens in humans is that the genes in charge of making this little receptor are off. There's something wrong. And so when you put in the needle, all the air escapes in the balloon all at once. So that's kind of an analogy as to what happens and how your body deals with these medicines that are natural products coming from these poppy plants. The uh, most recent study on the genetics from um, Taiwan they took uh, 150 people with heroin disease and 150 people without match controls and they checked their genes. They know which genes are involved. There's 18 of them. They looked at 13 and they found that four genes predicted the uh, addiction. So in other words, just draw blood from both groups and see which ones have the genes. 85% of the heroin group had the genes. In the control group, 125 people, guess how many had the genes? None. So we're getting pretty close to, and it makes sense, that we do have this, uh, this genetic kind of guardianship in your brain for 99.5% of people. 5% have something wrong with the receptor, and they're no longer protected. So we can look at this wonderful natural product as Sawyer Mosler, the father of internal medicine, said back in 1900, God's own medicine. So back to the opium trade. So there has to be a legitimate opium trade, which not many people know about, and it's very lucrative. Forget about heroin. It's very lucrative because it's pain medicine. What could be more wonderful? 
95% of manufactured pain medicine in the United States goes to treating pain. 5% is apparently diverted. A small amount goes to treating heroin addicts, not nearly as large as most people realize. So the, the Tasmanian folks wanted to set up another uh, field over in Australia nearby. And the Australians became very nervous because of a heroin problem. Now, what is heroin? Is heroin from these plants? It is indirectly. If you take morphine, morphine, which is from these plants, and you acetylate it, which means you mix it up with uh, vinegar, and you get a new medicine. So in 1807, morphine was used uh, extensively, used extensively during the Civil War. In 1898, right about the time of our Spanish-American War, a drug company in Germany called Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, that sound familiar? Acetylated morphine and made a new drug called heroin. Now heroin, here's a bottle of heroin that people used to get. Now it's not really a real bottle. I don't want to have a bunch of police in here. This is a fake bottle, nothing in it. And this is a bottle of heroin that uh, back before the, uh, in the early 1900s, you could go to the store and buy this. You didn't need a prescription. Heroin. So heroin is basically morphine that's been changed a little bit and it's a better drug for pain. You don't get as much nausea, you don't get as many side effects. It's a great drug. And it's about the same strength as oxycodone or a Percocet. So the opium trade sent uh, wholesale medicines legally to the drug companies like Bayer and Bayer made heroin out of it and it's a pain medicine heroin is a pain medicine heroin is the trade name we in science don't usually use trade names but this one kind of stuck uh, it is diacetyl morphine so it's morphine has been modified a little bit so people have become addicted to these drugs since time in memoriam, and everybody kind of knows that. And what you need to treat the addiction is, unfortunately, more um, opium products. And now we use things like buprenorphine and methadone, all of which are narcotics, all of which originally came from the poppy plant. The poppy plant has made the world a much better place because of the treatment of pain. We are seeing in this country a terrible fear of the addiction of, to heroin. So in 1925, our government made heroin illegal, which means us doctors cannot prescribe it. So these are in tablets, heroin or diacetylmorphine, wonderful drug, like I say, about the same as oxycodone. So anyway, the trade in opium, the legal trade, got mixed up with the illegal trade. Uh, it's a very murky business. And the United States tried to enter into international agreements to control the legitimate opium productions because of fear of heroin. Really, you could be just as afraid of any of the opium products, but this is easily injectable and it's cheap. So this is what got us into trouble. This particular pain medicine got us into trouble. And now we have international agreements and all kinds of funny uh, arrangements in order to try to control the production of opium from this wonderful little plant. And that's what's caused us all the problems. Thank you and good evening.